My name is Alex Dorgen. I'm an Ansible solution architect, and I'm going to walk through some additional development environment tips that build on some of the existing tooling that I've walked through, as well as adding in some other capabilities using some of the Ansible development environment tools that exist today. So in one of my previous videos, I did walk through the idea of Ansible Creator and how I can leverage that through some of the CLI capabilities to build out either Ansible collections or build out Ansible projects for a repository that I might be building. With one of the Ansible extension updates, I can actually do all of that through the UI now, so there's no need to be familiar with the Ansible Creator commands. So I'll walk through how that can be used in a fairly easy fashion. If you're also using the Ansible extension and you've got a newer version of Ansible Lint, you can add into the extension the dash dash fix capability, which will automatically fix linting issues. So anytime I save or open a file, it can actually automatically do some of that fixing for me. So this is similar to how Ansible CodeBot works today. I can do all of this before it ever ends up in my repository. It won't fix every single possible linting issue, but it'll fix common things such as not having capitalized initial names, not having fully qualified collection names, some mismatch order of certain things like blocks where the when should be at the top of the block. All of that will be automatically fixed by adding this dash dash fix in. So again, I wouldn't need to do this in the command line. It would just be built into my Ansible extension process. With the newest version of the Ansible extension 24.8.0, as well as newer ones that will come out later, you can now do full playbook creation if you have Ansible Lightspeed enabled. So this also includes a nice interface where I can just type out exactly what I want to do, then takes you to an outline page, and then we'll develop that full playbook for you. And I can take existing playbooks and have it be explained to me in a nice human readable language. So it does nice things such as if check mode's enabled, it will say this won't change this particular task. It will talk through what run once might require for a specific task. So it's a good, easy way to take an existing playbook, maybe that someone else wrote, and have a very clear understanding of what's going on. And then one of the other tools that I've leveraged recently is Ansible Dev Environment. So this allows you to pretty quickly stand up Python virtual environments with collections and dependencies installed. So if you're getting started for the first time with Ansible and maybe you're not quite ready for execution environments or you don't really want to build an execution environment yet because you're custom creating your own collection or you just want a very quick and easy way to get started, Ansible Dev Environment is a pretty quick and easy way to set up your own Python virtual environment with all the dependencies. And I'll also show how that can be leveraged with the Ansible extension to do some of that syntax highlighting and autocomplete that you might need. So let's jump into the demonstration to see how all these different pieces can tie together. So jumping over to my code server environment, I've already got a number of repositories already created, but maybe I'm ready to start developing an Ansible repository for Google Cloud. So as you can see, I currently don't have one created, and I want to build out scaffolding for it. So rather than jumping into the terminal and jumping in the command line, I'm actually going to leverage the Ansible extension and click Get Started for the Ansible Content Creator section. And as you can see, I've got that playbook creation capability as well as an Ansible collection project available to me. So I can just click you know, Create That Playbook Project. I can browse the directory I want. So in this case, I'll do that. some of the pre-browse to my current Ansible folder. And then I'm just going to add in the new Ansible GCP. And my organization is Shadowman, and maybe I want a GCP project. So this will build out that scaffolding for me. I can increase the verbosity and log output and all that, but I'm just going to click Create. I can see the logs. I can see that it was created. So if I go back to my file explorer, I can scroll back up and I can see that an Ansible GCP project now exists. And I can see that it built out some basic things, basic scaffolding for me, including an Ansible Navigator.yaml, an Ansible config, a basic Linux playbook, network playbook. So exactly the same capability I saw through the command line before, but I can do this all through the Ansible extension and never need to leave the graphical interface. So it can be a quick and easy way to get started with an example collection that's been built out for me. So I can just as easily use the collection built scaffolding to build a more detailed collection if I want to build my own custom collection. But in this case, maybe I just want to build out a few roles that I need to leverage inside my Google environment. So one of the other things that I would like to take advantage of is just the capability to do basic linting. So as you can see here, I definitely have some linting errors where I have you know, the U not capitalized. I don't have fully qualified collection name available for YUM. I'd like to, as an end user, not have to handle those things. Let's let them be auto-corrected so they'll never end up in my repository and I won't even get the red underlines for that capability. So if I go into the extensions themselves, go to my Ansible extension and go to the extension settings, I can just add into the validation for lint. I can add in dash dash fix. That's all I need to do. 
you will need to be on an old, a newer version of Ansible Lint. So if you get any sort of errors while you're trying to run dash dash fix, just note that you'll need to be on a newer version. And all I'll do is go back to this existing playbook and I'm just going to save it because Ansible Lint only runs when I open or save a file. And you'll see it automatically change this U into a capitalization and I'll automatically add that fully qualified collection name for the YUM module. So a very quick and easy way to do this all from my editor before it ever ends up getting pushed into my repository. So it adds that extra layer of assistance if I'm not necessarily an Ansible expert and I don't really know, you know what some of those common linting rules are. I'll paste in the description down below what those linting rules are. It obviously will not auto-correct everything for you and depending on what the collection is, that fully qualified collection name update may not work. But this does give you a pretty quick and easy way to at least handle some of the common linting rules and errors that you may have. And that's also why in some of the settings that I use, I already remove extra white space, add the extra rule on the bottom. That's all handled by VS Code, so I don't even need that dash dash fix to handle it, but ensures that some of those common linting errors that users run into, I'll never have to experience. So the next thing I'll jump into is that full playbook generation capability. So as I mentioned before, you do need to be on a newer version of the Ansible extension, in this case, 24.8.0 or newer. And that's once again in that Ansible section in getting started. So because I'm on that newer extension in this environment, I can do that playbook with Ansible Lightspeed. So I'm already logged in on Ansible Lightspeed, so I don't have to go through that process again, but I'm just basically going to pass in a command for patching my rel servers. So I'm gonna patch our rel servers using DNF, check to see if they need a reboot, and reboot if necessary. Fairly common patching scenario where I don't necessarily wanna automatically reboot every server. I wanna verify that they need to be done, and it does have some examples underneath as well. So I'm gonna click Analyze. This will then create an outline of these steps. I can verify that this makes sense from my standpoint or modify them as necessary, but this does seem pretty standard to me where I'll do the patching, check to see a reboot, and reboot the server if required. Note this will also use best practices. So you'll notice even though I said using DNF, it does use the package module because that is the best practice in terms of leveraging the, uh, the different modules because it will determine what the specific package manager is underneath. And you'll see that it does use the needs restarting dash R command to see if rebooting is required and then reboots the server if necessary. So a fairly easy way to write a three task playbook without needing to go into really all kinds of details for each individual task and the multitask generation. I can just describe it in a human readable form, click generate and I'm off and running. So this could be great for those that are not necessarily familiar with Ansible or they may not be familiar with the specific modules for something in Google Cloud or AWS. So one of the other capabilities that was added in was playbook explanations. So I can either through this, do this again through that Ansible tab and click explain the current playbook, or I can actually just right click in the window and click explain the playbook with Ansible Lightspeed. That'll pop open another window. This will essentially go through the entire playbook and explain it in human readable terms exactly what this playbook is doing. So I'll add in quite a bit of context, especially since I'm using check mode and I'm using star for my default. So as you can see in this task explanation, it's saying you know, prerequisites, making sure that those particular modules are installed. So I need to make sure the ansible.windows collection is available to me. And it also goes through the process of saying, you know, check mode, so it won't actually make any change to the system. It does specifically say that the category names is set to star, which wants all, all updates. So it's smart enough to know that star means all. It does have accept and reject list to admit if I want to do defaults and it even indicates that I'm registering a patch result so I can use that in my debug task. It talks to my debug task and says that I'm actually displaying the titles of the updates that were installed. So it's smart enough to look through this particular JSON query to determine that I'm getting those title updates. And then I've got a custom collection that I use to build reports. And it does indicate that this is using the delegate task to a specific server and only run once. And this is to ensure that the report is generated only after all servers have been patched. Pretty straightforward. And obviously I don't want to create my report until all the particular servers have been patched. So this can be a good way to get started. And personally, I will say this is much more intuitive than some of the single or multitask generation that existed before. And it's also a great way just to give users that may have never seen some of the playbooks that you're showing to them a quick and easy understanding of exactly what this playbook is doing. So even if you haven't necessarily created some of the best task names, I could populate this, show end users exactly what's going on and then maybe use this to update some of the tasks based on what's provided uh, within the Ansible Lightspeed prompts. So the last thing that I want to show, and I'll switch over to a new code server, 
So this is a RHEL 9 server that I've installed absolutely nothing onto other than code server. So I can even show that there is no Ansible installed at all. And also I don't have Podman installed. So I'm not gonna leverage execution environments or anything like that. I will install some pieces. So in my particular environment, I wanna leverage Python 3.11. So the default for RHEL 9 is Python 3.9 but I don't want to use that because in my particular instance, I want to leverage the latest and greatest of some of the Ansible development environment tools, which all run on Python 3.11. I will say one of the challenges that I found while getting used to Ansible dev environment is that it leverages the default system Python, which as I just mentioned was Python 3.9. So I did have to do some extra pieces with update alternatives to set Python 3.11 as the system default. So when I do some of the Ansible development environment commands, it actually leverages Python 3.11 to stand up that Python virtual environment. So I am gonna do the pseudo alternatives to set the default to be Python 3.11, and then I'm going to configure it to make sure it actually points to Python 3.11. In this case, I'm just gonna hit selection one because it's the only one I have set up. So now Python 3.11 is my default. Again, I've installed no other Ansible tooling on this. So I'm going to install in Python 3.11 that Ansible dev environment. So this will give me some Ansible tools, but still, I don't have any collections installed or anything like that. So I will prove that by pulling down one of my existing repo repositories. So there's my Ansible networking repository, which obviously none of those leverage built-in Ansible collections. So if I jump into this repository, I'll jump into one of my roles. You can see that, well, yes, the built-in modules might work. I actually don't have Ansible installed, so the config fails. I'm not getting the syntax highlighting for Ansible POSIX or built-in service or containers.podman or anything like that. Even just looking at the individual modules for Arista or Cisco, none of those show up as available possibilities. So this isn't necessarily very helpful from a development standpoint. I'd rather have some greater capability. So what I wanna do instead is I'm going to nav navigate into that Ansible networking folder, and then I'm gonna use Ansible development environment, which runs as ADE to use the existing collections to install into a Python virtual environment. So in this case, I'm going to leverage this existing requirements.yaml in my repository, but you can see we'll install my different networking requirements as well as ansible.net common. So it'll install all this as well as Python libraries and system packages. So it does all of that capability. So if I wanted to run Ansible playbook afterwards, I could, but for my case, maybe I just wanna have the capability to do some basic syntax highlighting. So I'm going to use the ADE install command pointing to this collection requirements.yaml, and I'm going to create a new virtual environment called Ansible Network. So this will run, and you can see it creates that virtual environment. It is creating that new folder. And because I did that update alternative to point to Python 3.11, this will be a Python 3.11 virtual environment, which is what I want to use. So I have the latest of Ansible core. It will have the latest of all the Ansible development tools. So this will take a second to go through and actually install the collections from the requirements file. Then we'll go through and install any dependencies that those particular collections have as well. The nice thing after all this is done is I'll be able to select that virtual environment. So you can see now it's going through installing the Python requirements for those individual collections. So this is very similar to how Ansible Builder works, but it's doing all of this inside a Python virtual environment. So again, if you're not necessarily at the point where I want to leverage Ansible execution environments, maybe because I'm just a single developer, this is a very good alternative. So maybe I want to leverage this now to get some of that syntax highlighting. Again, it still fails because I haven't selected it. I don't have a Python environment. So I'm going to select a Python environment. I'm going to enter the interpreter path. I'm going to find. So if I go back to my Ansible networking folder, I can see that I have this Ansible network environment that I created, my, my binary file, and I'm just going to do Python 3.11. This will refresh the page, and you'll notice as soon as this opens up, it actually will have a Python virtual environment, and all this syntax hiding will work because I installed those collections into that environment. So I can see it's running Python 3.11.7, I'm on Ansible Core 2.17.1, and the syntax highlighting for all the Ansible collections works, including Arista, Cisco, and BIOS, because all of that were installed inside that requirements dot yaml you can see as part of opening up the terminal it actually did that activate for me so in here if i did ansible dash dash version you'll see that i'm running 2.17.1 so a very quick and easy way to get started with collections and if i decide 
you know, I'm ready to move on. I don't need this virtual environment anymore. All I would need to do from the command line is deactivate. And then I can just delete that folder. So I'm going to do a full delete of the Ansible network folder. It helps if I actually use the correct command. And this will delete that entire folder. So the virtual environment's done, all that collection downloads done. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So this could be a very quick and easy way to do some of that syntax highlighting, some of the autocomplete, and it could do testing since I have installed Ansible Core into that environment without making really any changes to the system itself. So just something to think about as you're trying to get started with Ansible and maybe aren't ready to leverage execution environments, don't want to leverage execution environments, or don't want to build a new execution environment. This can be a quick and easy way to get started with some collections that you need to run testing on, or at least have some nice visual indications of the syntax for those modules. I'm going to place in the description down below some of the additional documentation for Ansible DevTools, which installs multiple development tools, as I walked through last time. The links back to Ansible Creator, so you can see what that's doing under the covers for the scaffolding that I'm building out either for Ansible repositories or for collections that I'm designing. I'm also going to include a link for the Ansible Dev environment that I just walked through, so you can see what that entails and how I'm setting up those virtual environments. If you have an existing Python virtual environment, it doesn't necessarily need to create it for you. So if you don't want to create your own um, alternatives to point Python to Python 3.11, you just want to manually create them using Python on, as it exists on your system, you can do that. I just wanted to show the capability of just doing it through the Ansible dev environment tooling. And then I'm also including a link to the Ansible Lint capability so you can see exactly what auto fix will fix for you since it is not a fully complete list since there are certainly some things that will require manual intervention. So you'll still get that squiggly line underneath that will tell you exactly what Ansible lint rule is being violated. And you can certainly click on it and dive into the documentation to see what some possible fixes may be. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about some of the Ansible tooling, especially some of the specific developer tooling that can help with some of the processes as you're getting more comfortable with Ansible. Click my picture on the right to subscribe or click the image on the left to watch another video.